She's not good for you, you're not good for her, and I will do everything I can to prevent it. Maddie, that's literally fucking insane. Maddie, Cassie, I See? I, this Ma is what I I'm said talking about. Maddie because we're talking about how fucking crazy Maddie is, which you can't seem to fucking comprehend. No, what you don't understand Nate is I am crazier. That's not something to be fucking proud of, Cassie. No. But it is something you should be scared of. Don't you just love some emotional manipulation sprinkled with a dash of blackmail? And who can forget the crazy ex-girlfriend trope, which in Euphoria is a step away from generalizing young women as crazy. No hate to Euphoria, of course, I actually really enjoy that show. It tackles some of the complexities around drug use, questioning your gender identity, coming to terms with your sexuality, and other teenage drama. Whilst the likelihood of all of these things happening within the same friendship group is small, these are real experiences that real people do have. Not all at once though, I would hope. But something caught my eye in the latest season. Spoilers, if that's not clear enough all ready. Something that caught my eye was the awkward love triangle between Cassie, Nate and Mazzy. Wait, I mean, can we even call this a love triangle? For argument's sake, we're going to call it a love triangle. According to tvtropes.org, this is type seven of the triangle relations, where character A, in this case, Nate, has reciprocated feelings for both characters B, Maddie, and C, Cassie. Except Cassie always knew that Maddie and Nate had a history and is suspicious when they spend any time together, and Maddie finds out about the other relationship eventually. Hey, Cass. Yeah? I have a quick question for you. What? How long have you been f***ing Nate Jacobs? <laughs> what, 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 what are you talking about? What caught my eye about this plotline was the demonization of both Maddie and Cassie, respectively. Of course, I would hope that Nate's actions throughout the series would be enough for anybody with half a brain cell to deduce that he is a flawed and unlikable character. He's arrogant, he's violent, manipulative, abusive, and this is also acknowledged by majority of the other characters. But what we also see is Cassie descend into a type of madness and Maddie be knowingly accepted as as the crazy ex. I would hope that it's clear why these characters act this way in relation to Nate's treatment towards them as well as, in Cassie's case, how other men have treated them throughout their adolescence. We also have the fact that Cassie's sister turns her life into a play which, understandably, turns her into a meltdown, but Cassie's emotional distress is criticised and mocked like that of a crazy girl rather than one that we sympathise with. For me, all I actually feel for Cassie is pity. Yes, her actions are immoral, but I don't find it funny that she's having a breakdown on stage. In fact, I feel bad for her. Though we have a tendency to develop some sort of moral compass and pray that Maddie, to quote a friend of mine, beats Cassie's ass, I would hope that we can also see the reasons as to why both of these girls have ended up in these situations and have developed these characterizations at present. I do agree that both are morally ambiguous and we don't have to excuse their actions and behaviors, but at the very least, we can try to understand them. However, when situations like this happen in real life, we don't have a bibliography of episodes detailing the journey a person has took before they carry out the action before us. In the same way that Nate hasn't seen the full extent of pain that both Cassie and Maddie have been through, both due to him and in other areas of their lives. Maddie seems to have no recollection of Cassie's pain, jumping straight to anger when she learns of her betrayal, but Cassie on the other hand, her guilt is manifested from seeing Maddie hurt by Nate countless times. The difference is, is Cassie isn't initially critical of Maddie, especially when Nate talks about how crazy Maddie is. Maybe this is because she understands that there's more to Maddie's behaviour than what Nate lets on. I mean, they were best friends. In fact, Cassie actually blames Nate for the rekindling of his relationship with Maddie, and she's angry with him not her best friend. Granted, she also doesn't defend Maddie, but she also doesn't try to see Maddie as this crazy enemy that you would 
expect her to see her as. It is only when everyone turns on Cassie and she feels like she has no one that she starts to become critical of Maddie. As soon as Nate used the word crazy to describe Maddie, I immediately saw this as a red flag. And I would hope that Cassie did too. However, I'm not holding my breath because Cassie has failed to see the numerous amounts of red flags that Nate has presented so far. Or at most has seen them and has knowingly decided to ignore them. But I recognise this as a red flag due to the repetitiveness of women being branded as not just crazy, but specifically as the crazy ex-girlfriend, or more recently, the psycho ex-girlfriend. Chapter 1. The Crazy Ex-Girlfriend According to Tropedia, the crazy ex-girlfriend, which I will be using interchangeably with things like psycho ex-girlfriend, is usually someone the hero used to be with and is not good with rejection. This is usually portrayed in a heterosexual relationship, so please excuse the heteronormative language that is used to discuss this trope. The ex becomes a stalker with a crush and will many times be perceived as the villain. Some other examples of this trope are Catherine in The Vampire Diaries, Brenda in the earlier seasons of Gotham, Amy in Gone Girl, Misa Romane in Death Note, even Lavender Brown in Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, but this is more subtle and probably more realistic to what the ex-girlfriend being crazy would be. And in Soapland, we recently had Mina in Emmerdale and Lydia in Coronation Street. Of course, there are male psycho exes like Joe from You and JD from Heathers, which all of TikTok seem to be fetishizing right now. Isn't it weird how crazy ex-boyfriends are hot and dangerous, but crazy ex-girlfriends are not attractive in the slightest? This trope can be used to describe the following storylines. Someone the hero knew was evil when they started dating, someone who turned out to be psycho within the relationship, or someone who was turned into a psycho out of the blue in order to kill off the relationship. In film and TV, the psycho ex-girlfriend is usually the first two examples. They are hyperbolic caricatures of this trope. Though there may be women in real life that do reach these levels of crazy crazy as some of these fictional characters, media tends to exaggerate these characters which results in them lacking the complex nuance that actual real life people have. But it might not be that these characters have no nuance. For example, in The Vampire Diaries, we do see elements of kindness in Catherine's character which remind us that she wasn't always the villain of the story, it's just that she was more the villain than not. However, most series tend to omit other parts of the character and focus on the dramatic parts. This is usually to keep viewers intrigued, especially young adults, but it also seems that these characters become one-dimensional as a consequence. It might not be that these characters aren't anything but crazy, it's just that them being crazy is all we really see of them, because it's essential for us as viewers to see them as villains. For example, a recent plotline in Coronation Street includes the character Lydia being out for revenge against her ex, Adam Barlow. Apparently this is for a numerous amount of reasons, perhaps she blames him for his brother breaking up with her, or really maybe she just never got over him when they initially dated. However, as some Twitter users have pointed out, this character art kind of comes out of nowhere. In contrast, the character of Mina in Emmerdale does have a gradual development. We knew that there was something off about her from the start, and for a while she did give us some clues before she, you know, went off on a murderous rampage. And again, in Euphoria, we see the supposed craziness in Maddie and Cassie evolve due to their circumstances. In real life, however, I would argue that the psycho ex-girlfriend that we hear the most about is the latter example. The one that suddenly turns out to be crazy at a convenient time that aligns well with the man's want to get out of the relationship. Don't get me wrong, abusive and vindictive women do exist in real life. They can be controlling, manipulative, obsessive, scary, and this may only be the side of them that people know. However, there are a lot of women who do get accused of being the crazy ex-girlfriend, 
when actually they aren't, or at least their behaviour isn't without explanation. Abuse or control and behaviour is never excused, regardless of the gender of the person that is abusive. But it's so increasingly common that this is all we hear about the ex-girlfriend. We don't get context of the situation. She's labelled as crazy without further explanation. This can leave the current partner quite puzzled as to why people still like the crazy ex or want her in their life. Maybe she isn't actually crazy. <laughs> Most likely, people aren't simply one thing. Now, I'm not going to blame someone for not wanting to give a detailed recount of their abusive or traumatic relationships, and you don't owe anybody any insight into a horrible past, but often the most common stories we hear about the crazy exes include things like double texting, accusations of cheating, which are usually as a result of previous cheating. Arguments due to situations that, actually, <laughs> she had a right to argue with you over. Behind this crazy behaviour, there is an explanation. Do I think that anybody should go through your phone or spy on you to suss out if you're cheating? No, of course not. That's a complete invasion of privacy, and Joe, don't even think about it. However, might there be an understandable reason as to why somebody wants to go through your phone? Absolutely. And labelling emotional behaviour, upset and distress as crazy, just makes it harder for actual abuse victims to be taken seriously. For every girlfriend that is labelled as crazy, for just one in commitment or knowing that she deserved more appreciation, we increase the likeliness that the emotionally abusive, violent girlfriend isn't seen for what she is. Because all it takes to be labelled as the crazy ex-girlfriend is just to be a bit too emotional or blow up your phone, right? The association is now trivialised, and people, usually the men, who actually have the psycho ex, are stigmatised. This also results in distrust by the new partner. I mean, I straight away made the assumption that calling someone crazy is a red flag. But by making this a red flag, Due to the misogynistic notion of labelling normal women as crazy exes, real abuse victims are grouped together and aren't even heard out or given the option to open up about their experiences. They are either silenced or forced into sharing something that's incredibly personal. I don't think that what is said about an ex should be completely discounted. Though it may be true that the way that someone speaks about others is more often more of a reflection of how that person is themselves, I do think scepticism should not be convoluted with complete disregard of what a person says. Chapter 2. Stigmatising Emotion. Part 1. Mental Health. Now, sorry, but I am gonna have to act like the language police here, just to demonstrate the issues with the words that we are using to describe everything from emotions to mentally unstable behaviour. Firstly, let's address the use of the word crazy when used to describe any person, regardless of sex or gender or sexual orientation. When used as an adjective, crazy is defined as mad, especially as manifested in wild or aggressive behaviour. However, as many scholars have pointed out, the term mentally ill is also equated with crazy, which is used to mean out of control and out of touch with reality. It's a negative term, and its flippant use to anything out of the ordinary creates a lot of stigma. On a less extreme level, it belittles the emotions of a person, equating their sensitivity, or what could potentially be a breakdown, to something less serious and laughable. But on a more extreme level, it semantically stigmatises those who live with mental health issues. This is when the word crazy is used to describe someone who is living with depression or anxiety, over compulsive disorder, personality disorders, or to describe those with other types of neurodivergence. Now, neurodivergence has become quite a buzzword in the last few years, but in reality, it's a term for when someone's brain processes, learns, and or behaves differently from what we would consider typical. The term is mostly used in discussions around autism and ADHD and other types of neurodivergence that follow that line because it was first coined to refer specifically to people who have autism. However, due to its meaning, 
meaning referring to how brains may work different from what we understand as typical, mental health issues come under this term too. I am aware we must, you know, tread quite carefully when we speak about this kind of thing, as mental illnesses are things that we often aim to fight or at least relieve the symptoms of, and this is due to the fact that mental illnesses cause quite a lot of distress. This can be easily convoluted with seeing all neurodivergence as a problem that needs to be cured simply because we relate mental health disorders with, well, health problems. Moreover, not all neurodivergents get equated to health problems or something to be cured. A lot of the time the more extreme or detrimental impacts that neurodivergents can have need to be controlled with therapy or coping mechanisms or medication, but in reality it's the environment that neurodivergent people are reacting to that needs to be more malleable, not the person that thinks differently to a supposed majority. When people who are neurodivergent act differently to their neurotypical counterparts, whether this be due to mental health or otherwise, the use of the word crazy can be attached, especially when their behaviour is seen as disruptive, emotional, loud, or as quoted in the dictionary definition of the word crazy, wild. And these are all connotations that are associated with a lot of neurodivergent types, not only mental health issues like anxiety and personality disorders, but also things like autism and ADHD. When neurodivergence is judged or discriminated against, a lot of the time we (laughs) use the term ableism, or we see it being used on things like Twitter. But strictly speaking, ableism refers to the discrimination in favour of able-bodied people, not able-minded people. This is because neurodivergent people can be both able-minded and able-bodied, or have different degrees of both, regardless of the neurodivergent type. In fact, I wouldn't actually argue that any neurodivergence means that they aren't able mentally, They just can't do it the same way that someone who is neurotypical can. That is a simplification, and obviously it's a bit more complex than that. The use of the term more able or less able or ableism is just a bit detrimental, and it makes us put neurodivergent people below neurotypical people without even meaning to. They're just different. It doesn't mean that they're less than. However, when it comes to mental health issues, the prejudice against people with mental illness has been called sanism because it favours those with a saner mind. I don't want to get too off topic here because we can debate the semantics of all these terms for hours when it comes to the rooted discrimination in vocabulary such as able and sane. So to conclude, this information has been touched on to show just how those who may differ from typical can be prejudged and words like crazy allow this to happen. This doesn't only mean those that aren't typical and are neurodivergent when it comes to neurology or mental health, but also those in society that we don't deem as typical, even though they are. People who are too sensitive or too emotional or who display an access of a factor that is conveniently understood as unpalatable. And to bring it full circle, who in history have commonly been given these traits? Women! Part two, the hysterical woman. Another word for crazy, I hear you ask, even though there's nobody behind the camera. Hysterical. This is the section of the video where I would expect people to begin to shout at their screens with things like, language doesn't have a gender, and you're taking political correctness too far. Even though um, the notion that language isn't gendered is actually quite woke, maybe there is hope for those people. Hysterical is derived from the word hysteria, a common medical diagnosis through the 20th century, only scrubbed from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders in 1980. But hysteria was never a gender-neutral term, as the word originated from the Greek word for womb. From this, one could assume that the symptoms of hysteria, usually related to emotional excess, were understood as things that came from the womb. Hysterical behaviour has been strongly associated with female sex or womanliness. Hysteria has even entered common knowledge as a special extra insanity 
to which women are especially susceptible. Therefore, it was mostly females and those with this anatomy that were diagnosed. Fast forward less than a century, actually. Hysterical can be seen as a term that also lacks gender neutrality. And hysterical is a stone toss away from crazy. So would it be fair to assume or to argue that the word crazy may also possess gender's connotations? Considering this video essay is about the crazy ex-girlfriend trope, I think it's obvious that that's the argument that I'm making. Magazines have made the point that calling women crazy is a misogynistic tool borrowed from past centuries, serving to minimise our experiences and manipulate us into thinking our emotions aren't valid. And though the World Health Organisation demonstrates that women are more likely to be diagnosed with depression and anxiety, they also um make the point that women are more likely to be diagnosed with these things than men because of that, even when men and women are experiencing identical symptoms. And so we have a never-ending loop. Women are more likely to be diagnosed as mentally unwell, and because of this likeliness, it's generally expected that this be what is wrong, and so diagnosis after diagnosis is made. Not only is there a history in medicine of society using language to stigmatise emotional women, but this terminology is also seemingly tied to women when described as romantic partners. Let's not forget the word psycho, which is definitely tied to our associations with gender. In a study by Eliza Scruton, when discussing the quality of someone as a romantic partner, the word psycho was almost entirely used to demean women. One article went as far as making the argument that calling women crazy is entrenched in the cultural subconscious citing many examples from pop culture, mentioning how the television show How I Met Your Mother warned of the crazy eyes and plotted women on the crazy hot scale, each forming the premise of an entire episode of the show. The naming of the women as crazy reinforces the men versus women binary, that men are illogical whilst women are emotional. As emotion is the antithesis of logic, women are deemed as irrational. They're Therefore, wrong and well, crazy to think the things that they do. Silly women. This can be seen as a form of gaslighting, telling women that their feelings are wrong and that they have no right to feel the way they do. Yes, you gas gate girl keep gate keep girl boss gaslighter. Or in Euphoria, we have Nate calling Maddie crazy because he chooses not to comprehend that he just, you know, might be the reason that Maddie is driven to such emotional lengths. Like, come on, the dude put a gun to his head in a messed up game of Russian roulette to get what he wanted from her. I'm surprised she isn't more traumatised than she is. Minimising somebody else's feelings is a way of controlling them. If they no longer trust their own feelings and their own gut, they come to rely on someone else to tell them how they're supposed to feel, and so, how they're supposed to act. No wonder both Cassie and Maddie keep returning tonight. This emotional manipulation and gaslighting technique is probably why so many people remain or return in abusive relationships. And actually, it's probably the reason why people take so long to realise when they have been abused or assaulted. Not only does the word crazy cause issues when attributed to an ex, it also causes issues when attributed to women in general. As soon as the crazy card is in play, women are put on the defensive and it derails the discussion from what she was saying to how she said it. We stop thinking about the reasons for the actions and the reasons for the emotions and instead we use it to label a person as one thing so that we don't have to face our own shortcomings. Not only does it stigmatise people with legitimate mental health issues, but it tells women that they don't understand their own emotions, that their very real concerns are secondary to your comfort. The concern of the girlfriend is detrimental. The love is detrimental. Her want for commitment or loyalty is detrimental. It tells us that the girlfriend was never the priority if her actions can be brushed off using the crazy ex-girlfriend trope. Now here's some food for thought. It's possible 
that the crazy ex-girlfriend trope was invented so that individuals never have to be responsible for the negative impact that they have or the actions that might have contributed to another's trauma. Thank you for watching this video, I hope it wasn't too long. I always comment about how long my videos are, it's because I've been standing in this spot for ages and my feet hurt. <laughs> Please let me know what you think about the crazy ex-girlfriend trope and cite your favourite crazy ex-girlfriends from different TV shows. And also let me know who your favourite Euphoria character is. Mine is the one that vapes that nobody really talks about. I hope you're well and safe and with that I'll see you soon.